live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Happening right now, the search is on. Bear County Sheriff's investigators need your help in finding a teenager they say is in danger. This is 14 year old Ana Alejandra Arroyve Ortiz. She was last seen yesterday afternoon at her home near Smith Road and Hickman Road. That's in the Von Ormy area. Bear County deputies and FBI investigators believe she could be with a man going by the name of Caesar, and they could be headed to Minnesota. She was last seen wearing a black hoodie, torn blue jeans, and white Converse shoes. If you see Anna or know where she is, call the Bear County Sheriff's Office immediately. That number is right there on the screen, 210-335-6000. All this information is also posted on our website at ksat.com. A crowd dancing with guns in the air. This is video of a party that turned deadly, and now it's at the center of a criminal investigation. 17-year-old Landon Reyes was shot and killed at that party inside an unoccupied home on the far west side, just north of Medina Valley Sunday morning. By the time sheriff's deputies got there, they say more than 100 people had scattered from the home. Reyes found dead in the backyard. Sheriff Javier Salazar says these parties inside empty homes, a troubling pattern that his deputies are dealing with more and more. They are utilizing vacant homes, many of which are new construction homes that are not yet occupied. Uh, they're putting out information, usually via social media, on where the next party will be, and they'll go in and they'll stage a takeover. The sheriff wants home builders to start to utilize up security measures for these finished and unoccupied homes. The sheriff also pointed out there are no leads on a potential suspect and urges anyone that may know something about this shooting. Please come forward. The family of a man named Christopher Olivares has waited nearly three years for justice, but that wait is almost over. Yeah, the man accused of killing him accepting a plea deal today, but as our Erica Hernandez reports, the sentencing is still to come. State of Texas versus Sebastian Hernandez. This packed courtroom was prepared for a trial. Instead, Sebastian Hernandez agreed to a plea deal in Christopher Olivares' murder. Mr. Hernandez to the Offense alleged in count one of this indictment as a first degree felony, the offense of murder. How do you plead? Guilty, not guilty, or no contest? Uh, no contest, no. The plea deal comes almost three years after Hernandez stabbed Olivares in September 2021. Police said the men were acquaintances, but it's not clear what led to the murder. Hernandez was arrested nine months later after his DNA matched forensic evidence at the crime scene and on the murder weapon. Sentencing will now take place on October 1st. What it will look like, a sentencing hearing will take place. Witnesses will be called up, and then the judge will decide what to sentence Sebastian Hernandez. The maximum she can give him per that plea deal is 32 years in prison. During the sentencing hearing, Judge Christina Escalona will consider if this was a crime of sudden passion. That means the defense will try to prove Olivares provoked Hernandez before the murder. If Hernandez violates bond or commits another crime before sentencing, the plea will be off the table. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic around town right now. I want to show you a trouble spot. This is near downtown I-10 at the Y. It's the westbound lanes of I-10. It's usually crowded here, but it's not usually backed up quite this much. There's construction going on on the upper level of I-10 westbound lanes. I mean, stretching as far as, you know, towards Hildebrand. But that is why there's a backup right now. Again, I-10 at the Y, very slow going. Let's talk about the forecast now. I don't think we hit 100 today, but it seems like we're going to do that pretty soon, Adam. Kind of felt like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's different. That's relative. Yeah. But meteorologically speaking, we did not technically hit 100 in San Antonio. 98, our high temperature. And look at the good visibility. You can really see downtown nicely from our, from our I-10 and 410 city cam here because we don't have as much African dust in the air. We got rid of most of that. We were 100 Pleasanton today. Del Rio topped out at 102. Eagle Pass 101. Typical temperature drop this evening. 91, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock. We're at 85 and then by midnight, 82 tomorrow morning, upper 70s, triple digits on the way and an update on Tropical Storm Debbie in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Students in Lavernia, the first in the area to head back to class this morning. KSAT live at Lavernia Primary School when the doors open for the year. 
One thing you might know about Lavernia primary kids and teachers are on a four day a week schedule. Principal Shelley Keck says it's great for attendance and great for teachers work life balance as well. Now we're working our way to some hot weeks this August. All this as the kids go back to school. Stephanie Cerna reports that pediatricians are encouraging parents to prepare kids not only for the new school year, but also for the warmer temps. Back to school for students in the San Antonio area also means back to class in the heat. So pediatricians are reminding parents to remind their kids to drink plenty of water throughout the school day. Yeah, I think encouraging our kids to drink water in a fun way. Example would be choosing maybe some fun cups that actually are colorful or straws that are colorful that'll kind of entice them to want to drink more water. And Dr. Yeah, Sabrina Perkins that. with Christus Children's really Hospital water. says drinks with electrolytes are good but water is the best choice. In fact, she recommends purchasing a refillable water bottle for the start of the school year. I think that's actually a hot trendy item right now is water bottles and then they're decorating with all kinds of stickers um, can be another fun way. But I think that them taking that to school allows them to not only start with a set amount of fluids that's each day and then they can hopefully refill. Dr. Perkins says not taking precautions for the heat could lead to heat exhaustion which could mean headaches, nausea, or vomiting. But it can also be extremely dangerous, even leading to heat stroke. I think we have to also ourselves teach our children that when we are feeling uh, overheated, get some fluids, if they're feeling headaches and dizziness, yes, take a step out, sit down, squat down, maybe just take a, get in the shade. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. KSAT.com, by the way, your one-stop shop for all things back to school, whether it's schedules or back-to-school backpack giveaways. We've got you covered on all things in between. Scan the QR code on your screen. It's going to take you straight to KSAT's back-to-school page right now. The Justice Department and a security consulting company visited the Uvalde Police Department last week to evaluate policies and personnel. The goal here is to rebuild trust and credibility in the community two years after the tragedy at Robb Elementary. It's part of the department's Guardian Initiative. New Uvalde Police Chief Homer Delgado says massive leadership failures led to the implementation of the Guardian plan. And he says it won't stop with just last week's visit. They plan on using community insight and recommendations as the department moves forward. An 18 year old could spend years behind bars after a crash that left a girl with life changing injuries. San Antonio police arrested George Gino Gomez, who they identified as the driver of a car that went out of control and crashed about 11 last night. They say the 18 year old had been racing on the highway, I-37 near Southeast Military, a 12 year old girl who was a passenger in the car he hit sent flying over a fence into a parking lot. She hit barbed wire, then landed inside that apartment complex where neighbors say they did their best to save her. I stayed on the phone with 911 and they had me on like a video with her and she was breathing and we moved her arm and straightened it out. Can you imagine? You hear something and you see a 12 year old laying in a parking lot. At last check, that girl was in critical condition at a local hospital. Police say neither she nor Gomez wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash. Today was the worst day on Wall Street since 2022. The Dow sunk a thousand points with growing fears of an economic slowdown. Yeah, it's all part of a global pattern in financial markets. Japan's Nikkei, pl Nikkei plunged more than 12 percent. It's worst fall in decades. These drops all coming after last week's weaker than expected jobs report in the United States and all eyes are back on the Federal Reserve again, which could cut interest rates after their next meeting in September. Imagine getting paid your salary for four and a half months without ever having to show up for work. That was the arrangement made for a top administrator at a San Antonio area school district after he was placed on leave last year. It is a serious issue when the district is essentially giving away public monies and receiving nothing in return. Lavernia's superintendent declined a request to be interviewed about the decision to continue paying Duffick while on leave 
for well over four months. In an interview with KSAT in the fall of 2020, Cohn told us, quote, whether we like it or not, we have to tell the story for what it is and be completely honest. Whether it's about finances or what a teacher did or what a superintendent did, it's about communicating. Duffick's personnel file included a two-page recommendation letter written by Cohn the same day the resignation and release agreement was signed, in which the superintendent highlighted Duffick's many accomplishments and wrote he played an essential role in the district's latest bond. Now we know he's gone. He's been, we sweep it under the rug. We move on. That's kind of how things been handled. Was it swept under the rug? Tuesday on the night beat, the take-home pay given to Duffick from a district now facing a budget deficit. It's on the night beat tomorrow. The potential for a new wastewater treatment plant near the Edwards Aquifer has the full attention of people living in Northwest Bear County. It's the fight over the Wahalote Ranch development. What conservationists say could happen if that plan goes through and who could decide how it all plays out next. Hundreds of kids will call this new elementary school home in the coming days. Tonight on the Night Beat, we're breaking down how Medina Valley ISD is transforming because of the booming population here in the county. That's tonight on the Night Beat at 10. By the way, happening later this week, Doc Talk. Here's how it works. You scan the QR code, type a medical question, any health question you'd like to ask a doctor, and a doctor will be here at KSAT to answer it. Doc Talk airs every Thursday on the news at 630. Now to an update on a story we covered as part of our Know My Neighborhood series. A fight to protect the Edwards Aquifer from possible pollution is moving forward in Austin this month. The issue is around the Wahalote Ranch property that's located about two miles north of Gray Forest in far northwest Bear County. A developer is asking the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to give them a permit for a wastewater treatment plant near the Edwards Aquifer recharge zone. It's a story we've been following for several summers now. Now, our Patty Santos has the very latest update. Mm -hmm. so it goes we have uh, asked to contest the permit for the wastewater plant. This month, we're closer to finding out the answer to that request. Behind the fight is the nonprofit, the Greater Edwards Aquifer Alliance, representing hundreds of property owners. They are asking the state for a special hearing to explain why the permit should be denied. The property is about five miles north of Halotus. Leonard Holmes has plans to build a subdivision with thousands of homes, but it needs a wastewater plant and permission by the TCEQ to dump millions of gallons of treated wastewater into the Halotus Creek. The creek is in the recharge zone for the Trinity Glen Rose Aquifer and the Edwards Aquifer Contributing Zone near the recharge zone. Opponents argue that any pollution that enters our water system could impact all of us. We would like to see uh, more conservation easements purchased. I mean, the city has done a lot, but according to the studies, uh, the threat of high density subdivisions and the threat from wastewater and polluted stormwater uh, is still very real for the Edwards, so we've got some more work to do in order to protect our water supply. On August 14th, the TCEQ Commission will meet in Austin to hear the request by the developer for the permit and the request by those opposing it in what's known as a contested hearing. The Guajalote Ranch property is owned by the Huntress family. The meeting is at 9.30 a.m. The public can listen in, but will not be allowed to comment. You can listen in to the meeting. We will post the link on KSAT.com. That was our Patty Santos reporting. Now, it is important to point out that the purchase of the property by Lennar Homes is pending this permit being granted. So it's not a done deal, and no work has started on that property yet. We'll continue to follow that. Tropical storm Debbie has flooded parts of Florida and could now bring potentially historic rainfall to Georgia and South Carolina. Debbie made landfall this morning as a Category 1 hurricane, but has since weakened. Yeah, at least 300,000 customers in Florida and Georgia powerless at one point today, too. Four people have died there. Emergency management leaders in Georgia and South Carolina are urging anyone in low-lying areas to heed evacuation notices. We have also been monitoring flight delays and cancellations out of San Antonio International. Right now, only two flights to Florida have been canceled because of Debbie. 
And, you know, Adam Kasky was talking to us just moments ago about how this is going to be a week-long story about the effects and after effects of Debbie. Yeah, and with these types of systems, sure, at landfall, you know, everybody thinks of wind, and I did see some wind gusts up to 98 miles per hour uh, in, you know, the Big Bend part of, of Florida, which is actually Dixie County, which had a gust of 98 miles per hour at 6 a.m. earlier today. But this is transitioning into just a major rain event, and that's going to be the headline here. Forget about the winds from now on and forget about any name or title it has. It's all about the rain and potentially historic rain on the coast of Georgia. You're talking Savannah all the way up through Charleston and even into North Carolina. Let's take a look at the latest on Debbie made landfalls a category one early this morning around 6 a.m. And that was near Horseshoe Beach, Florida, in that Big Bend area, part of Florida. Again, Dixie County area. And you look at it right now, winds of 50 miles per hour, but that's nothing. The headline here is the rain. There's a lot of rain with it, but the problem is it's not just the amount of rain right now. It's the fact that the system is going to slow and crawl and basically stall out over the coming days. It may meander back over the Atlantic and then come back on shore. It's really uncertain exactly the path it's going to take, but that doesn't matter. The bottom line is there's a ton of moisture with this system. And we all know when these are moving slowly, the rain adds up quickly And this white area here that you see around Charleston, South Carolina. That's 10 to 20 inches of rain possible within that area. And basically anywhere from Savannah to Jacksonville and Wilmington, North Carolina, there could be 10 to 20 inches of rain. That's the potential all the way through Friday. So that's going to be the big headline nationally speaking is going to be the potential for flooding and just how much rain is squeezed out of that system. That's just stalling and not moving much. Let's get to our triple digit days. So far this year, we've had 12, a dozen. Not that bad considering this time last year, we had 40. And by this time two years ago, we had 56. I think we're in pretty good shape. Tomorrow we start the day at 78. We'll be 93 at noon and then 100. So triple digits, the high temperature 100 even will hit that around 4 or 5 p.m. and not much of a breeze to move the air. Pleasanton Hondo 100 Uvalde up to 102 Del Rio 103 along with Carrizo Springs. Honestly, temperatures are looking a little more summer like and August with our high temp or average high of 97. August is actually climatologically speaking the hottest point of the year here in San Antonio. We'll make it up to 102 by Thursday and Friday and then a little drop to 99 by Saturday. And the reason for that is because the upper level high, the heat high, the big blue H, it's settled basically overhead right now, but it's going to be drifting a little westward, just enough westward, I think, by this upcoming weekend where it's centered over North Carolina or North Carolina, New Mexico. I'm still thinking Debbie in my head because of all the rain and those folks there. Anyway, over New Mexico, and that gives us this northerly steering flow aloft. It could be just enough to push a little boundary in place, get a little energy overhead and kickstart a few showers. So we're talking a 20% chance Saturday and Sunday, kind of like what we saw over this past weekend. We could see again this coming weekend. Nothing significant, but a little glimmer of hope for a few showers. So we're talking triple digits returning and a little chance for rain coming up at 645. We're also talking about an area of potential development that we'll be watching as it could move into the Gulf of Mexico in the days ahead. And then outside right now on live cam, I do want to point out not as hazy. Remember last week, that thick haze overhead from the African dust, especially late in the week and into the weekend. That's not the case anymore. Nice, crisp, baby blue sky and no African dust over the next five to seven days will be noticeable. Yeah, there's downtown. I see it. You can see it off in the distance. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right. So I didn't know this was a thing. I mean, it makes sense, but I didn't realize, Larry, that midnight practices were a thing for football. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how many schools do it, but it seems like every season when it gets underway, we have a handful of more schools more, yeah. yeah, that have midnight practice, and it's pretty cool, right? So Holy Cross football held a midnight practice and seeing those lights shine off those golden helmets, it's awesome in my opinion. Plus, Texas State football, well, they're about football, and they're also about video games coming up.
The Holy Cross Knights football team held midnight practice last night and they loved it. They didn't waste any time to get to work as they look to have another amazing season. The Knights went 10 and 3 last season, 3 and 0 in taps Division 3, District 3, while advancing to the state final, following the Dallas Christian 28 13. The Knights are loaded with talent with 10 returners, starting returners on offense coming back, and 9 on defense. They're predicted to win their district and they're expected to make another deep playoff run, and they kick things off with midnight practice. It's amazing, you know, I know everybody has been looking forward to August starting and practice starting and you know, this is the first day everybody gets to come out here. So being able to come out here first thing in the morning, being one of the first teams out here in the state of Texas is a big deal. Oh, it's special seeing all the community gathered together, all of our parents, everybody here show up. Um, it's an awkward time, but I really like the the kind of motive behind it that we're going to work as soon as we can. You know, once TAP's at dead weekends, we're going right, right back to work. And uh, I've kind of, always, this is my second year doing this, and I think it's beautiful that these guys are ready to work no matter what time of day. Those helmets shine under the lights. Holy Cross will start the season Friday, August 30th at home with the Antonian Apaches at 7 p.m. The Burning Greyhounds will play the Piper Warriors in the 2024 KSAT Pigskin Classic. It goes down Thursday, August 29th, 7 p.m. at Piper Warrior Coliseum, and you can watch it live on KSAT 12. In Little League Baseball yesterday in the Southwest Regional Tournament in Waco, the Texas West team from Bernie beat Louisiana 4-1, scoring all the runs in the second inning. So Bernie will play in the championship game tomorrow night at 6 with a trip to Williamsport on the line. All right, in college football, Texas State Bobcats are getting ready for season two under head coach G.J. Kinney. And while the Cats are hard to work on the field, the guys are mastering their football skills off of it. KSAT 12 Sports' Nick Mantis has more. Well, the Texas State football program has already shown a lot of progress from last season to this season. They have a brand new quarterback at Jordan McLeod, who was the best player in the Sun Belt Conference last season. A bolstered defense, thanks to the transfer portal. But one of the biggest topics that the players have been excited for is off the field and with a controller, playing the brand new College Football 25 video game. Oh yeah, I play it all the time. Uh, got it as soon as it came out. It's uh, it's really fun, especially like knowing different people, whether it's on this team or other teams. And the game hasn't been out in 10 years, and you know you were little playing it, but now you're actually in the game. You don't even have to create your player; it's already there. Playing with your teammates is really fun. My only issue is the 90 speed. That's a little crazy. So you're faster. You yeah, most definitely. Played the game the first day it came out. It was very exciting. You know, we haven't had college football in over 10 years. So just having an opportunity, like playing with guys from all over the place, playing with yourself, you know, you're going to get a lot of Texas State versus a lot of Texas State. That's exciting to see. I feel like it, it actually helps you learn the playbook a little bit because, you know, your actual plays from your schools on there and you see the things that you can do and like knowing the different players. So you're like, oh, come on, man, you're better than that. Like it's just very competitive nature. Best game on the team. That's a good question. I really don't know. All right, well, no matter who's got the best game virtually, reality is about to hit on August 31st when the Bobcats host Lamar University right here in Bobcat Stadium. In reality, from San Marcos, Nick Mantis, back to you guys. Thank you, Nick. So playing a video game as yourself. Can you imagine? That's, that's crazy. got to be crazy. Yeah. That's wild. I, I do admit I do play that game. Yeah? Yeah. You good at it? No. Okay. But, yeah. I don't play it. So I have fun. I I have fun. <laughs> All right, thanks, Larry. You got it. Okay, question. Raise your hand if you have ever griped about traffic lights. I have. Larry, you raised yours too. Yeah. Okay, well, coming up at A Case That Explains, we wanted to find out, are traffic lights really timed in San Antonio? And who controls them? A Case That Explains is up next. Did you know that 110 years ago today, the first electric traffic light was installed in the U.S., went up in Cleveland, Ohio. Ever since, drivers have had their gripes about the lights <laughs> on their route. Okay, we're mostly, mostly joking yeah. about that last part. But it is true that no matter where you're from, no matter where you're going, we all deal with traffic lights. So are they actually timed? And who owns and operates the lights in our area? We found out in this case that explains. <laughs> I'm a very impatient person, so I feel like every light is long. Trying to take a left turn, and it just takes forever. Everywhere is crowded, <laughs> all of it. And the traffic lights is not very well synced here. Their complaints, local public works departments hear often. 
Yes, yes, we do. The most common thing that we get is people are at the light too long, that they're waiting too long for a traffic light to turn green, or it didn't let enough cars through, or that the traffic light is not green long enough. I think there's the, there's two common misconceptions is that, uh, you know, these signals are not timed correctly. Well, they are. The other is who's responsible for that signal. Three groups are in charge of timing and maintaining local traffic signals, the city, the county, County and the Texas Department of Transportation. That map represents one of the 1,145 traffic signals that the city uh, operates throughout town. This is the TransGuide Operations Center. City Public Works employees are here monitoring information from traffic signals and all these cameras. Right now we have about 250 uh, intersections that have cameras. Not red light cameras, those are banned in Texas. These cameras give crews a real-time road view. We can watch Watch to see is the light operating the way we think it should be operating and then we have equipment that is recording uh, how long each light is green and red. SAPD also has staff here as well as via bus dispatchers and TxDOT. There's a rarely known code in our Texas Administrative Code that says if a city is over 50,000 population they own and maintain the traffic signals on our highways. In our area, that applies to San Antonio and New Braunfels. So in those two cities on all TxDOT roads, the city owns and maintains all traffic signals. The exception is any frontage road traffic signal along a freeway. TxDOT owns roughly 200 traffic lights on local frontage roads, but here's where things merge. We pay the city of San Antonio to maintain about 130 of those frontage road signals. In smaller cities in Bear County that have fewer than 50,000 people, TxDOT owns and maintains those lights. But because some roads in those cities are connected to San Antonio streets, there are exceptions, like in Leon Valley. We pay the city of San Antonio to maintain those traffic signals for us in Leon Valley just because San Antonio has signals north of there, they have signals south of there, so it kind of, they tie it all together as one system. One system with a lot of different timing programs. How do you determine how long the signals need to stay green or when they need to turn red? So we do an engineering analysis uh, at every intersection where we go out and we collect uh, data. We look at uh, how many cars are going through the intersection and what direction they're going, how many left turns they're taking, how many right turns. And we also look at how many pedestrians. Time of day is a factor too. City traffic lights usually have three timing programs, one for the morning rush hour, one for the evening rush hour, and one for the times in between. For some locations, we have even more than that because we have some locations that have like a heavy lunch period, for example, or some that have unique uh, traffic patterns on the weekends. So we may have a different timing plan that runs on Saturday versus one that runs on Sunday. When lights go from green to yellow to red depends on that pre-programmed timing and motion detection at the intersection. So, for example, if you have two cars waiting to make a left turn, then they will get less screen time than, let's say, if we had five five cars waiting to make a left turn. The city re-examines traffic signal timing every three to five years, or when something new is built, like a new neighborhood or shopping center, for example, or more often, when they get complaints. On the county side of things, there are far fewer traffic signals. Bear County operates a total of 62, but that number is growing, including this new signal here at Wiseman Boulevard and Tillman Ridge, all to accommodate a brand new subdivision. This is the, the brains right there. That's the, that's the computer for the traffic cabinet. This is where that timing is controlled. There's always going to be a minimum time and a maximum time, which if there's no traffic, it'll just do the minimum time. If you do have traffic, you know, there's a lot of cars, it'll, it'll shut off at the maximum time and it'll allow the, mo the most cars it can while still keeping in mind that there's another leg that needs to go through. That minimum and maximum time varies at every intersection. The city of San Antonio says lights will typically be green 60 seconds on a main street, 30 seconds for a smaller street, and 15 seconds for left turn lanes. Three of the most traveled intersections in San Antonio are Southwest Military at Zarzamora, Calabra at Westwood Loop, and Petrenko at Hunt Lane. Bear County Public Works says it doesn't track an average time, but they do know the busiest intersections 
Alamo Ranch at Lone Star Parkway, Alamo Ranch at Alamo Ranch Parkway, and Bulverde Road at TPC Parkway. In the next several months, the county is upgrading to a system that will allow them to monitor traffic signals remotely. We can connect automatically from our desktop and look to see if someone calls and says that there's something wrong, we can actually just log into the system directly and check it. The county, the city, and TxDOT say the goal is to keep people moving. The timing may not be perfect, and all that traffic... I'm from a small town of Lubbock, Texas, and we don't have that problem. It's not perfect either. Sometimes it's just the people's driving. Most times it's just the people's driving's fault. <laughs> So what do you want to see us explain? Scan this QR code here to go straight to the KSAT Explains page where you can find all of our coverage and a place to send in your own ideas. Answered a lot of questions for me. Good. Yeah. The Veep Stakes <laughs> almost over. The latest on Kamala Harris. Search for a running mate when we return. Vice President Kamala Harris spent the weekend mulling her running mate options. The so-called Veep stakes should be all wrapped up by tomorrow evening. Should. Should. Could be the key word. And as Jay O'Brien reports, this all happening as the Trump campaign tries to clarify some controversial comments made in the past by Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance. Vice President Kamala Harris hurtling towards announcing her running mate expected to come before tomorrow night when she and her VP pick will hold a rally in Philadelphia. Sources telling ABC News Harris met one on one this weekend with top contenders, including Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz and Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, but hasn't yet made a final decision. Anything on the beef steaks yet? I got nothing for you, man. Meantime, Trump's VP pick, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, still facing scrutiny over controversial comments like this one from 2021. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies. This morning, Vance's wife, Usha, responding in an interview with Fox News, calling her husband's remarks a quip. What he was really saying is that it can be really hard to be a parent in this country. And sometimes our policies are designed in a way that make it even harder. Recent battleground state polls showing Harris running better against Trump than Biden. On GMA this morning, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, instrumental in the Democratic effort to push Biden not to run, downplaying reports she was working the phones to pressure the president. The only person that I spoke to about this was the president. Other people called me about what their views were about it. And, but I rarely even returned a call, much less initiated one. Back to that impending VP pick. After that rally in Pennsylvania, Harris will then blitz six more battleground states in five days with her new running mate, introducing them to the nation. Jay O'Brien, ABC News, Washington. Look outside with live cam once again this evening. The dust is out of here and the heat is on, Adam. Yeah, the heat is on. We have a few isolated downpours that popped up today. Not a whole lot, just a little bit farther to the west and even south of San Antonio. Again, just a couple out there right now, just west of I-35 from Divine to Pearsall and in western Atascosa County, even near Charlotte. But you see these are just creeping along, quick little splash and dash downpours. Now, earlier today we had these downpours everywhere you see a color on the screen and Hondo downtown only five hundredths of an inch, but up to half an inch, but a mile south of town. Triple digits return and an update on the tropics, what we're watching now and where it could go in just a bit. All right, are we about to string together a bunch of 100 degree days? <laughs> we're Adam, we're stringing them together, baby. Yeah, we're going to start to, but you know, <laughs> <woo -hoo. laughs> but it's been 30 days, you know, since we've had triple digits and compared to the past few years, I mean, this is nothing. This has been a cakewalk and July was good to us, not just in terms of lack of triple digits, but also rainfall, well, above average rainfall and some decent rain. All right, let's take a look at our headlines. Triple digits, they return rain, a small chance by the weekend. And yes, we've been talking about Tropical Storm Debbie. That's going to be the main headline, I think, nationally when it comes to the weather. Possibly historic flooding from coastal Georgia up through the Carolinas, South Carolina, Charleston, and even into North Carolina. But what I want to talk about right now is the next system we're watching for potential development, this cluster of thunderstorms that's currently just moving into the Caribbean, the Eastern Caribbean there. And that's moving westward 
through the Caribbean slowly throughout this week with about a 30% chance of development as of now. We often see that change and slowly rise as the days go by from the National Hurricane Center. But the point is, is that this whole area of the Caribbean and even the Bay of Campeche is where this system could go. So if this does develop into the next tropical, say, depression or tropical storm, there's a good chance it could end up in the western Gulf of Mexico and the Bay of Campeche. And then, of course, we really have to watch it even more closely for potential impacts to Texas. Right now, it's a long shot, but it's still a possibility, not a probability. Look at our high temps. 100 tomorrow, 101 Wednesday, up to 102 Thursday and Friday. But keep in mind, at any point in the afternoon, it could feel like it's 105 when you factor in the humidity. Here's the latest look at Tropical Storm Debbie. Was a Category 1 early this morning. Landfall around 6 a.m. There you see just southeast of Tallahassee was where the landfall was. A wide rain shield here with showers and thunderstorms. It'd be fine if this just kept moving and kept going on its way and got swept out to sea again, as is often the case. But with this one, it's going to stall overhead, sit and stall and just dump a ton of rainfall. I mean, we're talking 10 to 20 inches in the coastal Carolinas. Around here, we do have a little bit of potential, as I mentioned, as we get into the upcoming weekend because we have a little shift in our flow and that gives us a little bit of hope, kind of like what we had last weekend. But the big picture across the nation, what really stands out is the southeastern U.S., coastal Georgia, south and North Carolina there because of that meandering system, the meandering remnants of Debbie just sticking around and dumping all that rain for days, 10 to 20 inches possible. Even over 20 inches wouldn't surprise me in some of the rain gauges there around uh, Charleston. 20% chance for us Saturday and Sunday, and that's because the upper level heat high, which is influencing our weather right now, it's going to come right overhead, boosting us to 102 for the middle and end of the work week, and then it slowly drifts westward and is centered over New Mexico and just enough to open up this northerly steering flow over the weekend, bringing us that slight chance of rain showers Saturday and Sunday, that 20% chance. As for tomorrow, nothing but sunshine. The rest of the work week, nothing but sunshine. I don't even think we'll have the typical morning clouds. We'll just have this wall to wall sunshine, 78 in the morning, 100 for the high temperature. Not much of a breeze out there either. either. Uvalde 102, Canyon Lake and Bulverde 98 tomorrow on the south side of Stinson 101 and a little drop in those temperatures down to about 99 by Saturday because of a little extra cloud cover and that potential for a few showers. Yeah, look at that cool spot. 99 degrees. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bring One it. One day. Thanks, Adam. All right, we're going to go dog surfing. Tell you about a competition when we come back. <laughs> In the buzz, forget hanging 10. These guys hang 20, all right? They're gnarly marlies. They're rover dudes. Dozens of brave canines from as far away as Europe and Asia hanging it all out in Northern California at the World Dog Surfing Championship. Hundreds of fans showed up to sh showed up and showed out to watch. All this Olympic excitement, I forgot about the World Dog Surfing I know, how could you? Awards were given out in several categories depending on the dog's size. Judges looked for the distance of the ride as well as style points, of course. Proceeds benefited several local animal rescue groups. I like how they have a little handle on their life vest so they can just <laughs> lift them right up. Yeah, that's handy. Yeah. A Philadelphia man has come up with a creative way to look for love. Tired of swiping on dating apps? He did this, Dave Klein. <laughs> 28 years old, a data manager. He rented a billboard and put details about his search for a date. Yeah, Dave says he's a good cook, has normal hobbies, and owns a cat. All pictured there. Dave's ideal date, well, he's into food, so a sit-down dinner and maybe lunch in the park. I like that. Want to go on a date with yeah. Dave? Dave is single. Good <laughs> news for dogs who prefer eau de toilette as opposed to toilet water. Dolce & Gabbana have released a designer fragrance for dogs. It's called Fifi. Stop it. In honor of Domenico Dolce's canine of the same name. Stop it right now. This Dolce. perfume is a, quote, olfactory masterpiece <laughs> featuring a touch of musk and the creamy undertones of sandalwood. A bottle will set you back $109, and it comes with a D&G collar with a tag. Strong enough for a man. Made for a dog. 
Made for a Fifi. Made for Fifi. That's all our time. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you on the night beat.